On the journey of life, there are many things to learn and experiences to discover. You should always try and better yourself in any way you can. You are not guaranteed success, however. Along the way, you might stumble or even fall, but sometimes you might faceplant. This is one of those faceplants. This is, or I guess was, Project Prime. I don't want to give the wrong impression though. I'm very glad that I actually worked on this thing. So it might have been a failure as far as ever releasing goes, but as a learning experience, it was definitely well worth it. So, a little backstory to this. A little over a year ago, I was perusing Twitter and looking at things that Rosefall and Richard F. had posted. For those that have been in the Rebelcraft community for a while, I'm sure you know exactly who I'm talking about. But yes, Richard actually had posted a 3D model, and I commented saying how cool it looked. And then, if I remember correctly, he actually asked me to talk with him. And just like that, I was actually brought onto the team as one of the game designers, as well as somebody who contributed to the story. Basically, I was doing a lot of concept work for all of the game mechanics. As prior to that, they had a general idea of what they wanted, but they didn't have any concrete balancing or gameplay mechanics just yet. So what exactly was the game going to be all about? Well, it was sort of a Robocraft like game, where you would build your vehicle and take it into battle. However, it had some pretty major changes past that point. The first off was what our coder liked to call a multexel system, if I remember correctly. It, forgive me, it's been a while. So what this basically meant was you could strap on parts on any angle you wanted to. Not just a simple six-sided cube face, if you had a slanted part, you could attach parts onto the slanted face. So from there, you could actually build some pretty crazy creations. Or at least, you would have been able to, if the game had actually continued development. The second major feature of the game was the factions system. This was one of the additions that I contributed to the game once I was brought on. So there were three factions, Valiant Metalworks, Hygris, and Zillion Assemblage. Our initial plan was to have the players start out just without a faction. There, they would get a general feel for the game. But after they reached a certain point, they would be given the choice to branch out and pick one of the three factions, each of which specializing in a different general feel to all of their parts. Valiant Metalworks was more of a traditional tanky military style faction. And their design also shows that as well. Most of their parts were aiming for more of a gritty, almost slight future feel to it, whereas Hygris was all about sort of electrical energy and being a way to the future. All of their parts would have boasted very sleek designs. And then we come to the most interesting, at least to me, and that is Zalian Assemblage, where the first two are human-run companies. Zalian Assemblage is actually run by an alien civilization. Which, if you would like to learn more, I actually do have an entire lore video out for that, where I read out all of the lore that I had planned for the Zalian assemblage, as a faction and as a species as well. Unfortunately, I never got around to writing out the Valiant or Hygris lore, nor did I write out the entire game's lore, but it is all up in my head still. Before moving on though, I should probably make it clear that a lot of the people were on the team for different reasons. Some people that were there were very salty veterans and didn't really like free jam all too much, so they kind of wanted to rub it in their faces by showing that they could make a better building block game than they could. Other people were there because they simply wanted to make something cool, and I myself, well, I kind of fall into the latter category. I was kind of just there for the entertainment of it all, as a learning experience, and, well, simply, it was fun. I really do enjoy coming up with concepts, and I have quite a few to show off to you. The first off was one of our main balancing mechanics, and this is the heat management system. So what I've come up with here is that there are three sections to this system. The operating heat, the generated heat, and the overall heat management. Each part that you add to your MEV, or modular exploration vehicle, as we call them, basically the vehicle you build and drive in the game. Each of the parts you added to it would add to the overall operating heat, and different part archetypes would have different overall heat ratings. So, for example, you can expect that things like 
tank tracks would have a high operating heat as opposed to wheels, which would have a lower operating heat, among numerous other stat differences. As you can see by the parts at the bottom, we give examples of certain vehicle archetypes. So, on the left we have a vehicle with a low part count. As you can see, it has very little gray, therefore it has very low operating heat. A vehicle with a high part count is slightly higher, and then, as you can tell, this was written over a year ago, back when thruster sticks were still a thing. So I gave that as an example to people in the team to understand what I was getting at. So yes, basically spamming an insane amount of parts in order to get crazy high movement speed for this example. You would obviously then have an extremely high operating heat, so you couldn't really fire a whole lot because you would generate too much heat and then you would obviously overheat. So you generate heat by using things like weapons and specialist parts. At 90%, you would start to hear an audio alert to saying that, you know, you should probably hold off, you're about to overheat, and it keeps getting louder until you hit 100%. If you generate enough heat to actually fill up the bar, you will then overheat. And overheating will lock all of your movement and all of your other parts for a few seconds while your vehicle vents off some of the excess heat. It won't vent off all of it, however. So even after you get out of overheating mode, you will still have to cool off naturally. And at that point, you've probably taken a, a lot of damage, so you probably want to get out of there. There would have been certain coolant-related parts in the game, such as venting fans or heat sinks, etc, etc, to actually help lower your heat. Some would lower your operating heat, and some would cool off your generated heat a bit faster. If it wasn't clear, by the way, Generated heat can never go lower than the vehicle's operating heat. I also toyed around with the idea of letting players go past the 100% threshold, but after they do that, they would start taking damage. I wasn't 100% sure on whether or not to do that, so I kind of left it out of anything. Anyway, speaking of damage, we now move on to my concept for the health and armor system in the game. This is a system I designed to be a little bit more realistic, I guess we can say. Whereas Robocraft's system is very arcadey, you basically fall apart like a piece of Lego, but that's obviously by design. Whereas the way I designed it in Project Prime, I made it a lot more visually engaging, as well as fun at all levels of destruction. Or at least, tried to make it fun at all levels of destruction. And the way I achieved this was having a health stat as well as an armor stat. So the vehicle has a total overall health pool, which is added to by the parts health stat. So a wheel, for example, would have had 100 health, but it would have had 400 armor. When the vehicle is getting shot at, say you get pinged by one projectile that deals 100 damage. This was obviously going to be a very high damage projectile, but I'm just doing it for the sake of an example. The vehicle's overall health, no matter what part you actually hit on the vehicle, it would lower the health by 100. And then, depending on the actual part you hit, it would also lower that part's individual armor by 100. So, going back to the wheel example, the wheel gets hit, you lose 100 health because it was a 100 damage projectile, but the wheel still has 300 out of the 400 armor remaining, meaning you would need to hit the wheel three more times in order to actually destroy it. With the armor value being far higher than the health value, this means that even when you're on the brink of death, you still have about 75% of your vehicle remaining. But it would be fairly obvious to you as well as the enemy that you're pretty close to death, because by the examples we have here, the lower your health bar is, the more visual effects you have going on on your vehicle. So at 75%, you would start to spark a little bit. At 50%, you would start spewing out a bit of black smoke and have more sparks going on. At 25%, you would have even more smoke and a lot more sparks. And when you're on the brink of death, you are pretty much going to have a massive cloud of smoke trailing behind you. This will also make it a little bit harder to actually try and hide away. So if somebody's chasing you, they could chase you around the corner. Now the smoke probably wouldn't travel for too far, but it's just kind of a neat, interesting mechanic. Of course, I won't be going into all of the details here. If you would like to read out the thing for yourself, just simply pause the video and you can go ahead and do that. Another system I 
came up with was a highly detailed information gathering system. Think of it kind of like an information warfare type of role. So having people play a role such as a spy or a data gatherer would be very vital to having a proper team composition. So going over the types of parts in this system, we have the core radar. This is a basic radar built into the core of every MEV. Again, that is modular exploration vehicle. And then we have the parts you can actually add on to your vehicle. First off, the basic radar scrambler archetype. It is able to counter the basic radar inside of the core block when activated. Activating it would start to generate some heat, but very minimal. Then we have the advanced radar. This will passively pick up enemy locations and is unaffected by basic radar scramblers. And then we have the advanced radar scrambler. This is able to counter all types of radar. And not only that, it also protects nearby allies from basic radar when active. So this would have been a very team supportive part. However, it would generate a fair amount of heat when activated. So this is more so for more specialized roles. Again, the spies or data gatherers of your team. And then we have the radar relay archetype. This would securely send your radar data to all nearby allies. And then the advanced relay. This would securely send your radar and sensor data to all nearby allies. What exactly are sensors, I hear you ask? Well, we're getting into that. First is the thermal sensor archetype. When it's activated, you'll see the heat levels of your enemies in your radar range. So this would be very useful to seeing whether or not people are close to actually overheating, letting you know if it's safe to go in for the kill, or if you should perhaps lay back a little bit. The second one is the structural integrity sensor. Much in the same way of the thermal sensor, this will allow you to see the health of your enemies within your radar range. Of course, you can still see the smoke and spark effects, but this would give a much more detailed description of exactly how much health they have. I was also toying around with the idea of possibly adding an advanced structural integrity sensor, and it would highlight parts that are about to fall off. So basically those with low armor left, letting you know which parts you should focus on. And then there is the alert system archetype. This would passively alert you when an enemy is gathering radar or sensor data on you. Now this is one that I kind of was unsure of. It does seem a little bit weird, and I didn't really implement it fully, so that was kind of a work in progress. Obviously, we had more parts besides the information gathering ones, and that would be the movement archetypes. Now, I say archetypes because there are the three factions, each of which has its own version of a wheel, hover, tank tracks, etc. Each of which would have different stats, but depending on the faction, they would all have a general feel, such as the Hygris parts having high acceleration. We didn't really fully flesh out all of the parts we had, but what we had planned as archetypes were wheels, hovers, tank tracks, light mech legs, medium mech legs, heavy mech legs, and then the light quad legs. So think kind of like the insect leg, sort of. The medium quad and heavy quad legs. Then the wings, helicopters, VTOL, and blimp. Blimp was basically the sky tank track. Slow and very tanky. And then on top of that, we also had thrusters and maneuvering thrusters as well. Which were not as powerful speed-wise, but were able to turn you fairly quickly. I also should mention that when we say wheel as an archetype, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a wheel. It's just going to act similar to a wheel. For example, we have the grav slider for the Zalian assemblage. It's definitely not a wheel. It's somewhat similar to a hovercraft in the fact that it's fairly slidey control-wise, but it would have remained very low to the ground. The other concept I worked on were the alternate movement modes. So every part in the game were going to have a secondary movement mode. The movement mode one would be their primary method of movement, and that's how they would always start the game as. But you could simply press a button at any time and you would switch to mode 2. In the case of the wheel, mode 1 would be drive mode, and quite simply, it is exactly what it sounds like. Driving at regular speed with full turning control, but going into boost mode would make you go a fair bit faster, however, it would limit your ability to turn a fair bit. So think kind of like a drag racer. You could turn a little bit, but not too much. Another really interesting one would be the hover control. So mode one would 
be clearly hover mode. Hover mode caps your maximum height at a few feet above the ground, but you can go into mode two, which is fly mode. So fly mode removes this height cap, but slightly reduces your speed due to the fact that the hovers now have to provide a whole lot of upward force. They can't provide as much of a forward force. Tank tracks would have their regular mode and then mode two would be vent mode. So this lowers your top speed by a fair bit, but it increases your heat venting per second. So this would be very useful once you're actually in combat. It would let you stick around a lot more. The light mech legs would have had a regular walking mode and also a sprinting mode as well. Increases your movement speed considerably but lowers your turning, but also generates heat as well. So sprint mode is a lot faster than the wheel's boost mode, but as a downside, it generates extra heat. The medium mech legs would have had a dash mode as a secondary. I planned this mode to work a little bit differently than the others. So how this would work is instead of actually switching permanently, once you press the key that would normally switch you, it would instantly dash you in the direction you were pressing. So if you're pressing the forward key, it would dash you forward, but it would not keep you in dash mode. This would have a bit of a cooldown as well. Then the heavy legs would actually have a stop mode. This kind of works the same way that dash did. Instead of switching to stop mode, it would be more of a special ability you can use. Moving on to some of my personal favorites that I was kind of looking forward to actually playing. Of course though, the game actually never really saw the light of day. But yes, the light quad legs would have had a grip secondary mode. This would extend claws out that would lower your speed and jumping ability, but it would greatly increase your grip, allowing you to scale much steeper slopes. Basically, again, think of the light quad legs much like the insect legs in Robocraft. Then the medium quad legs would have had a super jump mode. This increases your jump height, but it now requires a charge up before jumping. And then the heavy quad legs are essentially my guardian legs concept, if you know what I'm referring to there, in the fact that they would have a lockdown mode. So it would plant your legs in the ground completely and immobilize your movement, giving you various perks to your weapons, etc. Of course, though, it does take a few seconds to enter and exit lockdown mode. It is not instant, so therefore you would be open to a fair amount of attacks. At this point, we had actually decided to combine the VTOL and wings together, far before Robocraft actually did it. So mode one actually starts out in VTOL mode. So this gives the full 360 degree range of movement and you are able to stop and hover mid-air. And then you can go into mode two, which is wing mode. This would increase your speed considerably and change your control system to that of a plane. And you're now no longer able to stop and hover, but switching between the modes takes a few seconds. Helicopters would have their normal flight mode, but mode two would be what I like to call precision mode. This would lower your speed and reduce the amount of drift you have. Drift, of course, is the continued movement you have after your inputs are stopped. It would also reduce the turbulence of up and down movement due to wind. And then the final one that I actually had come up with a mode two for was the blimp, AKA the tank tracks of the sky. First mode is flight mode and second mode would have been maneuvering mode. So this would have greatly increased your ascending and descending speed. So the speed you go up and down, but while in this mode, it would generate excess heat. I should also mention that we had general ideas for weapon archetypes as well. These were classified by size. So the small class of weapons would have been a rapid fire archetype, a single fire archetype, and then we have a close range lobbed explosive, think a grenade launcher, and then a ramming weapon. Medium sized weapons would have been snipers, rocket launchers, missiles, and a repair weapon. And then the large size weapons would have been a heavy cannon, think a tank cannon, and then artillery, think more of a mortar type weapon. Another thing we tried to go for in the game was to make it so that weapons didn't really need a whole lot of redundancy. Even the small class weapons didn't really need a whole lot of extra weapons in order to make your vehicle a bit more viable. You could strap on simply one or two and you would be good to go. Now, I do have a huge amount of information on the weapons, but I think I'll kind of skip over them because if I did, I would be here for even longer than I already am. But one of the last things I do want to go over is my concept for the industry paint schemes. This would have basically been our monetization feature, as the game would have been free to play. Another interesting fact about this is that each of the factions would have had a different paint scheme. So instead of the traditional red versus blue type thing, 
it would be all of the Valiant color swatches versus all of the Hygris color swatches. So Valiant, as you can see, used a lot of oranges and yellows, as well as a lot of military style colors, which definitely fits with their theming. All the Hygris colors are much more nature oriented. So swampy greens and sky blues, among others. Zalian, on the other hand, had a lot more exotic looking colors. So pinks, reds, purples, and blues. The epic color set you could also buy would have been iridescent, which meant depending on which angle you were looking at it, it would change color. One of my personal favorites out of all of the epic class colors would have been the ice color from Hygris which changed from white to a nice icy cyan color. There were also things like champion colors. These were unlocked free of charge, you just had to spend a lot of time doing different achievements. Again, one of my personal favorites out of this category was what I like to call Sunrise, and that was one of Zalian's colors, where you had to finish as the MVP of your team 500 times. This started out as a nice creamy yellow color, which transitioned to a hot pink. Now, congratulations to you, you've made it to the end of the video, or I guess somewhat close, but there is some things that I do need to discuss first. Obviously, everything shown off in this video are simply concepts designed by myself. Most of it wasn't actually implemented fully into the game. Hell, we never really got out of the pre-alpha state. If I remember right, we were only kind of in development for a couple months before things started to fall apart, for various reasons. But in the end, like I said, it was a learning experience, and I quite enjoyed my time working on the project, even though it didn't really go anywhere. So apologies if I kind of teased you and you think this sounds like a really awesome game. Again, they're just concepts. But I know how many of you like my concept style videos, so I figured I would put this together and give out all of the information that wasn't previously available to everyone, assuming you actually knew of the project while it was going on. However, the game team, or at least some of the game team, actually does live on. So if you are interested to see what Richard F. and Rosefall, among others, are up to, you can go ahead and check out the game they're making which is a tower defense style game. Originally, I was working on it alongside them, doing fairly similar things that I was doing in this one, but I had a lot of other things that kind of got in the way for me. So I had to excuse myself from the team. But yes, that is Oracle Falls. I should have it in the description, but if I don't, just go ahead and search up Rosefall on Twitter. Anyways, guys, I will now finally wrap the video up. I, of course, have been the awesome soul. I thank you so very much for watching, and I will see you next time. Take care.